Hey everybody, Adam here with Hometown Acres. Welcome back. We are 500 miles away from the property here today. We are visiting our in-laws in Connecticut. That's where my wife is originally from. And I don't know if you can tell from looking out the window here, but they live in a 55 and older community. And that leaves not a whole lot for somebody like myself, a uh, firewood cutting, tractor driving, excavator operating guy to do. Uh, around the holidays. I mean, we've got Christmas parties and things to go to, but after that, it's uh, not a lot to do here. Too many houses, not enough land. So we're, uh, we're gonna be heading over to a friend's house that we've got to meet through YouTube, where uh, it'll be my home away from home whenever we come visit the in-laws here. He's got a firewood yard set up and we'll be there here shortly. All right, so we are at Jake's here from Dude Ranch DIY. You guys may remember he's been in a couple of our videos in the past when we went to Ohio Woodburners open house. Yep. And when we got back from the open house, we came back to our place and burned some big uh, brush piles back in the woods. But uh, as soon as I pulled in, I couldn't help but notice your roadside firewood stand. Did you come up with this on your own? Yeah, totally on my own. <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's all original, Dude Ranch original. Yeah, the uh, <laughs> pallets, the brown paint, the white lettering, the metal tin roof, the pay box. I've, I think yeah. I've seen this before. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it definitely took some inspiration from you, Adam, <laughs> um, and I'm really gr grateful that I did because this thing has turned into like, I think you've said it on your channel, it's like an ATM yeah. in your front yard. Well, I can't take full credit for this because I did base my design off of Dan from Back 40s. Right. His is green, his is set up a little bit different, uh, but yeah, this one <laughs> looks very, <laughs> and it's, it's crazy how many of these I see going down the road that look a lot like ours, and I'm like, oh, yeah. they must... They must watch YouTube and they've probably seen our videos. So. Right, well, since I built it, there's literally three more on this same road. And, uh, you know, I guess they liked the idea, yeah. so. Well, anyway, let's take a look back here at your wood yard. So I, I told them that I'm 500 miles from home. This is gonna be my new home away from home whenever we come visit the in-laws here in Connecticut. Yeah, absolutely. you're and, welcome uh, anytime. I was, we were walking back here and I was like, man, I think you got a nicer firewood yard than I do because you got all of the, um, uh asphalt millings back here so you're out yes. of the mud yep we are walking on the Merritt parkway here <laughs> yeah. connecticut route 15. <laughs> so how how many loads of asphalt millings did you get back here for free um i'd say approximately between 75 and 80 i think okay. um i did it in like kind of two uh big major phases where the first one where we cut in this all used to be woods um, and it basically ended about at, at the width of where the log pile starts on this right side. So it's kind of long and narrow. And then we did a major expansion last spring where we basically like doubled the size of the work area and then doubled the size of this road itself. Um, so between the two, we got about like, you know, 35 or 40 in each segment that we did. Yeah, I mean, and I was lucky to get them for free. <laughs> I was going to say asphalt millings in our area are stupid expensive. Like. 25 30 dollars a ton like limestone in our area is 35 38 dollars a ton depending on where you go and this would have been i don't know ten thousand dollars worth of material oh, to yeah i mean there, there's a guy down the road that sells screened asphalt millings for about 350 a triaxle load um and obviously now these aren't screened you can see there's bigger pieces you know chunks who cares about yeah exactly <laughs> the tractor just puts them in you know and uh 
you know, locks it all in place and it, it's been a great road base to work back here. Now from watching your videos, it seems like your firewood inventory is a little low right now. It is. You can tell by the uh, massive amount of empty baskets that I have. Um, a lot of this stuff is for next year. A lot of this wood was all white oak and hickory and stuff actually from the expansion that we did, you know, the trees that we took down. Yeah. So um, I've pretty much sold the majority of my bulk firewood inventory for the year. And I'm holding on to some stuff to keep the roadside stand stocked. Yep. And, um, you know, I do stockpile a lot of standing dead ash. So that's all boneless, skinless, as I like to call it. And you can pretty much split that and sell it on demand, right? Yeah, I like to give it a, like usually two weeks to let it just air dry that last final bit. But um, well, the when you're drying firewood, probably 60 to 70 percent of the moisture you lose in the first two weeks and then it's that last 30 percent that is what takes a year to get out right so you're you're close yeah yeah and being that you know the fact that ash is only about 40 percent moisture content when green as opposed to oak which is like 75 yeah you're already way down there and this stuff is you know clearly is barkless standing dead so it you know nature has been doing its job for us or the drying for us. Now, if you're not familiar with Jake's channel, Dude Ranch DIY, you are an arborist by trade, right? Yep, I'm a licensed insured arborist. Um, I have my own you know, business that I do, the firewood and the tree work. Um, so a lot of this wood is from the jobs that I do the tree work at, and I take the wood off the job and obviously charge to haul it away. So you're double dipping, actually triple I'm, dipping. Yeah, it's, I, if you can count how many times I'm dipping, uh, <laughs> I mean, you're a, you're a CPA or were. Cause you're, CPA. you're charging to cut the tree down, you're yep. charging to haul it away, and mm -hmm. then you're charging for it when you sell it as firewood. Yes. That is maximum efficiency right there. Yeah, there is not, understand. and then I'm heating my house for free too from all the scrap. Yeah. So. Yeah. And we were talking earlier, you kind of cherry pick through what you keep because we all know that most tree service wood is gnarly, junky stuff that I don't really like fooling with. But if you, I mean, there's still nice trees that come out of tree service jobs. So you take the good stuff and then yep. you've, you've got places you can get rid of the, the big crotches and yes. that stuff. Yeah. So I, I have a couple friends with outdoor wood boilers and I have the ability since I'm the one taking down the tree and running the chipper and everything and my guys, we can select nice, you know, eight inch limb wood that we normally would just send through the chipper um, and put that off to the side and chip the gnarlier, you know, bendy stuff and, and all the, the brush and then, you know, take take the nice logs. Yeah. So let's take a quick look at the uh, equipment you've got down here. I was telling Jake earlier, seeing his shed that he's got here over top of the East Main Axis was part of my inspiration for the equipment shed we build with the lean to style roof. and. Just a very simple construction design. Yeah, yours has purlins though, mine doesn't. I yeah. got in trouble for that. <laughs> <laughs> the purlin police? The purlin police. Yeah. But, so what is it, Easton made 2228 with attached yep. conveyor? Yep, and uh, this thing's a beast. I got a couple different wedges for it. Right now the seven-way pizza box wedge is in. That's what I run the majority of the time. It makes the nice small splits my customers like because I'm selling to more recreational burners. I try and avoid the people looking to heat with wood, you yep. know, just because they're not willing to pay the, the price that I they like to charge. They want to pay $50 for a quart of wood. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which by all means, if you can get that, go right ahead. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we built this thing and um, just kind of did it down and dirty. Uh, we, we got the telephone poles off a job and very you know, rustic. Just, I like kind of went from there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kubota L25? 3901. Yep, so it's like a 39 horsepower. Um, I got the rear tires loaded. I got about 1,200 pounds in the big tool rack between bags of tube sand and uh, suitcase weights. All right, well anyway, I think we're gonna get to get to work here. What do you got planned for us here today? Yeah, well, we got some uh, tree work done by uh, yours truly last weekend, and we got a bunch of big sticks left to drop, you know, some spars, so. I was thinking we could maybe get one or two of those on the ground and so you already uh, topped them out we just got another what 30 40 feet of tree top or tree yeah to cut down. yep we had the spider lift here last weekend so it made it really quick and easy we were able to get almost all the way back here um, between the removals and the pruning so we could pull them over i even got a rope already in one of them Perfect. and uh you know buck it up it's some nice big boneless skinless ash to buck it up and then send it through the box wedge on the east made i think it'll make some really nice firewood heck yeah let's do it so last weekend when we took the top out of this tree uh while we had the spider lift still here i had my buddy chris 
put a, a rope up in it um, just because we like a little you know mechanical persuasion i.e the tractor so uh we, we got the rope already tied up there i had this covered up because i didn't want the rope getting soaked and i got a block up over here on this little black birch tree so we're essentially just going to use that as a redirect that way the tractor doesn't have to be in the line of fire when we drop this spar and it can be pulling back that way and the tree will come this way right across the roadway here so All right, Jake, I want to hear the arborist tree felling technique straight from the horse's mouth. What's your plan with this tree? All right, so this tree is all, it already has a bow to it. I call this a banana peel, like a nice little bow to it. So the weight is already going towards where we want it to go. But Adam came and said, let's make this as difficult as possible for you. <laughs> so I said, let's make this the safest so that if somebody's very uncomfortable with cutting down trees, yes. what is the most surefire way to drop it where you want with no barber chair? And so that also just happens right. to be the most technique the heavy. Most, probably one of the more technical uh, ways that I am familiar and, and often use to fell a tree. So what we're gonna do, it's called like the five step method. And basically it allows you to drop a tree and I typically use this on trees that have a lot of lean to them that have a higher risk of barber chairing when you're making your back cut. But basically we're gonna make our front notch, you know, our directional cut, and then we're gonna bore in behind that and we're gonna basically make our back cut, but we're gonna leave a, a strap, a hinge of wood or a strap of wood on the back. So it's gonna be cut all the way through up to our hinge point in the front of the tree. And then I'm gonna come in below, a couple inches below, and make a back cut underneath where I did the bore cut, which basically allows the, the wood to break vertically off of itself. When I then leave the premises totally, i.e. being the safest method, I'll hop on the tractor and we'll give it a little mechanical encour encouragement and it'll snap that little back part that's holding this whole spar up and it'll fall right where we want, if things go to plan. Now I'm familiar with that term as being called the trigger because at that yes. point, the tree is like a loaded gun. It's ready to go as soon as you pull the trigger. Right. Um, I think that'll help people visualize the tree. You do all of the prep work ahead of time and you leave nothing but just the smallest little sliver holding it up. And then when you're ready to go, you can fall the tree safely and be out of the way. Yeah, and that's why I like to use it for trees with a high risk of barber chair. Cause when you're making that back cut, that you know back wood likes to separate. And uh, it's basically, you're doing a, a controlled barber chair here almost on a very small scale. Yeah. Yeah, this is basically for demonstration purposes only. Normally, right. if I wasn't here doing a video on how to fell a tree. This thing would have already been down. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have some old uh, fencing here that's grown into the tree. So I'm gonna be doing everything a little bit higher up, but um, you know, the important thing with, with doing a cut like this is do it where it's most comfortable for you. Because if you're reaching up really high or going down really low, everything's gonna be off and you know, just do it where it's nice and ergonomic, comfortable. That's probably, I'm gonna use that as my excuse of why my cuts never line up because I'm six foot five. So. Yeah, there you go. <laughs>
All right, guys. So um, as you can see, I made my face cut up in the front, which is going to direct it. I left a nice amount of hinge and holding wood, about an inch and a half, two inches up above the base of my hinge to act as a backstop. So, you know, if it, this was a potentially leaning tree, it wouldn't close and then shoot back at, you know, the feller. Um, so we got our hinge wood. As you can see, I left a nice back strap on both sides. So now I'm going to come in and make another cut about three to four inches down below that and bypass. So I'm going to cut past where I, I did, you know, my back cut or my plunge. And it's just going to be that wood there, that vertical strip that's going to be holding this whole thing. And then when I go to pull it with the tractor, that's going to sever and the whole thing's going to fall hopefully where we want. All right, so we got the first tree on the ground, made it as difficult for Jake here as possible. I'm gonna let him do his thing now and get these other three on the ground real quick, normally like he would, probably without a rope, just drop them right where he wants them to. Then we'll go ahead and get some firewood cut up here and start running the Easton made. Let's do it.
All right, so we just finished up uh, those two logs that we got split up there. I know that the 500i makes it look like it's pretty easy cutting, but if you've yeah. ever cut dry season standing dead ash before, it's like cutting concrete. Right, yeah, and it's they're, they're pretty hard. They've been well seasoned. You can see they're totally uh, skinless there with no bark, so yeah, it's tough. But that saw, is, I mean, that saw, I gotta hand it to steel. They did a good job with that one. It's pretty powerful. It made it look like you were cutting regular firewood and really you're cutting probably one of the hardest things you can cut there is, is dry ash. Yeah, it's, so, it's been great. But one thing that really caught me off guard, we were running the Easton May 2228 is how well you guys do it keeping up with the waste product while you're splitting i mean we're running the machine you guys are over here cleaning up sawdust you've got your catch bins for all of your uh kindling and scrap that comes off the bottom because you know a box wedge does create a lot more scrap than yes. than a traditional single knife splitter does absolutely but there's a trade-off there right yeah i mean you see you know just the the lack of effort needed to split rounds that big um, the biggest thing, you know, the most effort that you need to do is to rotate the round. And that's only if you want to keep your pieces consistent. And then, I mean, even while we're doing this, they're still taking scrap from the bottom of those bins over there. And they've got a, a fire going here that they can, you know, keep, keep material burning and keep it out of the way. But with as much of a mess as we made, I mean, this area is pretty well picked up today and that's the key right just stay on top of it don't yeah, let it get out of control exactly once you let it get out of control it takes a lot longer to clean it up than if you just stay on top of it and we do separate out a lot of the kindling we have a kindling tote back there as well as a chunk tote and that's you know what we burn in our uh, wood stoves to heat the house and we have several kindling totes over there um, you know so we separate that out as we're burning it and uh, you know that way we try and put to good use as much of the log as possible. Yeah, you don't realize how much you can get into sorting and filtering as you do when you start doing firewood because you've got right. <laughs> different species. You've got boiler wood, you've got cherry, you've got oak, you've got kindling, you've got big stuff and small stuff. And yeah, you got to have a different pile for everything. Exactly. Yeah. And that's why you need so much space. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you never have enough space. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, guys, I want to thank Jake for having me out here today, getting me out of the 55 and older community and letting me have a day in the wood yard. Uh, a lot of people have mentioned in the past that we've gotten away from firewood, which is what made our channel Hometown Acres. Uh, and we've branched out into doing other things, building stuff, uh, dirt work, all that kind of stuff. But Jake here at Dude Ranch DIY does a lot of firewood. So if you miss the firewood content, go check out his YouTube channel, Dude Ranch DIY. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, give us a big thumbs up, click that subscribe button. We'll catch you on the next one. Thanks See you for later. Watching.